Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and uh, this is the first recorded lecture for Module 3. And in this uh, first part, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of what causes the Cold War. And then we're going to talk about the early events of the Cold War through the Korean War, um, which was a brief war, but uh, still was, was very bloody and pretty nasty. Um, and it's kind of a almost forgotten American war of the 20th century and so forth. So, um, but it's a, a very important part of uh, American history and for the 20th century as well. So I want to start out this lecture uh, kind of showing you some some little funny things uh, that came out in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, for instance, this one. Uh, yeah, I want to fight communism, but how? With true dollars, okay? Um, so trying to get money, raise money to try to root out communism uh, in the country and so forth. Captain America, which was the first comic book uh, created in the United States. Originally, Captain America was fighting Nazis during World War II, uh, but then after World War II, now he's a commie smasher. So uh, you can see um, kind of how the Cold War even shapes uh, culture and so forth. Uh, this was a funny thing, better dead than red. Uh, and then this was actually a movie that came out uh, at the time uh, with starring Robert Ryan, who's a famous actor. Uh, I married a communist. Oh, and he's a spousal abuser as well. So, um, so what exactly caused the Cold War to to happen and so forth? Um, it really, if you look at uh, both sides, are to blame for the Cold War certainly. Uh, but Stalin is what uh, his action is what started it. Um, Stalin was distrustful of the U.S. and Great Britain during World War II because of um, the United States and Great Britain not opening up the second front in France until the summer of 1944. Um, it took a lot of planning for that invasion, the largest invasion uh, ever assembled in world history to be successful. Uh, of course, the United States had much smaller uh, invasions and, and uh, D-Days and so forth in the Pacific theater that uh, were no less um, uh, well planned out or, or uh, uh, well, probably more planning went into the invasion of Normandy, but uh, certainly the bravery was the same. Um, on the storming of the beaches against the Japanese as it was against the Germans in France. So, but Stalin had, was distrustful. Um, but at the Yalta conference, Stalin had promised FDR and Churchill that he was going to allow free elections, particularly in Poland and Eastern Europe. You got to remember Stalin um, and the Soviet Union invaded Poland ruthlessly in 1939. Stalin also had uh, uh, taken prisoner about 2,500 Polish uh, military officers, despite uh, Poland having surrendered and he had them liquidated, which caused quite a bit of controversy um, because the, the U.S. and Great Britain didn't want to spark another war um, after fighting a really nasty World War II. They didn't take disciplinary actions against the Soviet Union um, because of what had just happened with World War II. Uh, but certainly Stalin um, and the Soviet NKVD uh, should have been held accountable. The problem is, is just the timing of it. Um, you don't want to find another war with the Soviet Union right after World War II, which would have led to more and more loss of life. So, um, but when the Soviet army had come in in Eastern Europe and liberated uh, those countries like um, Ukraine and Belarus uh, and um, uh, Poland and uh, Yugoslavia and others, um, they pushed for communism in those countries. And I mentioned this previously in one of the World War II lectures, but they are going to, um, between 1945 and 1948, uh, prevent free elections. The communists would uh, murder some of the Democratic Party leaders um, in terms of pushing for uh, free elections and democracy and so forth. Um, they also would run them out of town um, and so forth. Another thing that was was particularly uh, tragic, you know, as my parents always used to say, two wrongs don't make a right, um, to punish um, the, the Germans from what had happened uh, during World War II. There's, there was quite a few German-speaking people that were in Eastern Europe uh, they were persecuted severely uh, in some Eastern European countries. In fact, in Poland, they were moved into the same concentration camps that the Germans had held Jews and gypsies and so forth, and other Polish people in concentration camps. Um, they drove them out of their country, and so it led to the biggest refugee crisis of the 20th century, um, not just with Germans, but a lot of different people groups from what had happened. The war was the worst war ever fought in world history in terms of loss of life and displacement. Um, and so, but particularly when, when, when Potsdam conference happened in the summer of 1945 and Truman kind of threatened Stalin that you need to allow free elections in Poland when Stalin doesn't, 
we end up having a Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union from 1945 until the end of the Soviet Union, technically 1991, but it really starts to end in 1989. So yet kind of a two and a half year period, uh, the Cold War actually ends. Uh, but during the Cold War, um, a lot is going to happen in the United States. You're going to have a confident nation emerge. You're going to have 60 percent of the country going to uh, be in the middle class and, and going to have number one economy in the world at one point. Um, massive consumer spending. Um, you're also going to have the civil rights movement. So there's a ton going on after World War II and, and World War II, both in world history and uh, American history is the greatest turning point of the 20th century by far. Uh, so much stuff happens um, in the world um, and then also um, in, in the United States as well. We're going to talk about all these different things throughout this, this module. Um, so Truman is going to be the first Cold War president. And uh, he actually, when he leaves office, was, was a pretty unpopular president. Uh, but history has gone back and looked at Truman's presidency, and he actually is recognized and is seen as one of our better foreign policy presidents um, of the 20th century. And he is now more praised uh, in American history than he was while his time in office. And so here's some kind of um, some important figureheads during the Cold War. And we'll talk about this throughout Module 3 and into part of Module 4 in the 1980s. So, for instance, uh, this right here is Soviet tank commanders going in Afghanistan, what happens in 1979, but we, um, they're occupy and pull out in 1988 um, uh, out of uh, Afghanistan and so forth. So what exactly was the Cold War? Uh, it was a period of heightened tensions, okay? The Soviet Union and the United States never actually officially go to war. Um, there is an arms race where they both try to one-up each other with building military weapons. It was also a space race where they're trying to race to see who can get in outer space first, um, who can get to the moon first, and also media competition where they would, um, you, you have democratic radio stations in Western Europe blasting in Eastern Europe how, how evil communism is, and then vice versa, radio stations in Eastern Europe blasting into Western Europe how evil uh, capitalism is. So you you see this this happen. I, I like to tell students it's kind of a one-up competition. They're, the Soviet Union and the United States are constantly trying to one-up each other. Um, oh, you did this. Oh, well, I'm going to do this better than you, and so forth. So um, both countries are going to fight different in different areas of the Cold War, but they never actually fought each other. So we're going to talk about proxy wars versus full head-on wars. Okay, this U.S. and the Soviet Union, I want to repeat this, never actually fight each other head-on during the Cold War. They came very close with the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, but they never actually did. And in the 1980s, there was a, a computer malfunction that where you almost had a nuclear war take place um, as well. But uh, it's kind of a lesser known event um, and um, was kept hidden for a while. Uh, but they are both are going to fight proxy wars. And these are wars where they don't actually directly fight each other, but they fight in other conflicts to expand either democracy or communism. So, for instance, the Soviet Union is going to fight in Afghanistan as a proxy war so starting in 1979 through the, through the part of the 80s. The United States is going to fight a proxy war in Korea to protect South Korea from the invasion of North Korea. And then also the United States is going to fight a proxy war in Vietnam. And um, so those are uh, indirect conflicts, but not direct conflicts. OK, so no, no actual war between the two countries were fought. You want to probably underline that in your notes. Um, and so it goes from from kind of late 1945, really beginning of 1946, when uh, Soviet Union doesn't allow free elections in Poland, all the way to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So we've covered Yalta in the World War II lecture. But let's kind of go over the highlights. Um, it does create a UN. OK, uh, Germany is going to be divided up into four zones. We'll talk about how that's going to be where the center of the Cold War conflict is in Germany. Four zones um, uh, for Berlin as well. And um, the you're going to have economic and political tensions here as well. So the Soviet goals is they want to build up Eastern Europe um, as kind of a, a buffer zone between uh, themselves and Germany. You got to realize the Soviet Union had been, or well, Russia and then, then the Soviet Union had been invaded by Germany twice, uh, once in 1914, throughout World War I, and then in 1941 and World War II. So Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union wanted a kind of a buffer state where these countries would be loyal to the Soviet Union. They would get attacked first while the Soviet Union could prepare if Germany ever invaded again. Um, Germany does not, and, and they're relatively pacifist to this day. 
Um, and so Stalin kind of called them satellite nations, like a satellite rotates around the globe. These satellite nations are going to rotate around the Soviet Union. Also, they wanted to promote and spread communism throughout the world. It was without question the Soviet Union did try to spread communism into other parts of Asia, Africa and Latin America. The American goals are uh, they want to spread democracy and capitalism. They wanted to expand American markets for great economic opportunity overseas. So they wanted capitalism that, that uh, does that. Um, and they wanted um, to stop the expansion of communism. So Soviet Union wants to stop the expansion of capitalism. America want, or the United States wants to stop the expansion of communism. Pretty simple there. Okay. Um, and so thankfully none of these countries actually go to war against each other directly. Otherwise we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, and, but we're going to talk about the arms race and uh, space race as well. So it's kind of democracy and capitalism versus communism. Now, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, after he was voted out of office as prime minister, uh, traveled to the United States and at the University of Missouri gave a famous speech where he said that a, an iron curtain has descended upon, uh, uh, upon Europe. And so what he's referring to is this iron curtain is going to be the division between communist countries in Eastern Europe, along with the Soviet Union, versus the democratic capitalistic nations of Western Europe. Now, you look at some of these countries are not really affiliated with that uh, because you have NATO versus uh, the Warsaw Pact. Yugoslavia is a unique country. They are communist, but they don't ally themselves with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Um, you look at Switzerland, a capitalistic country, but doesn't ally itself in NATO. Switzerland's always kind of chilling and making lots of money off of other countries with their uh, uh, investment banking system. And so you look at uh, um, these areas of the world um, are going to be either allied to uh, the U.S. or allied to the Soviet Union. And um, as you can see, this region right here is allied with the Soviet Union, along with some other areas like North Vietnam, North Korea. Um, you're going to have later, you're going to have Cuba, um, who is going to be allied to the Soviet Union and so forth. And then later, you're going to have different African nations that are going to uh, eventually become communist as well. And then some are or not. Okay. So um, Stalin, um, one of the things that, that made Stalin difficult, uh, later his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, is not like this. He said that capitalism and communism could peacefully coexist, but Stalin argued that it never could. Uh, so communism doesn't allow freedom of religion. In fact, Stalin had suppressed uh, religion big time in the Soviet Union. Then during the war, he allowed East Orthodox Christian churches to open back up and then he shut them back down right after the war um, and, and so forth. The, um, it is a state-run economy. The, the government controls everything. It is a one-party system, uh, no private ownership of land, and there's no freedom of speech or the press. The U.S. is the opposite of that. Okay. Now, um, so we talked about the Cold War beginning. Okay. Um, also, the Soviet uh, Union wanted to try to capture some of the oil areas of Iran, and particularly two of the earliest conflicts in the Cold War is going to be Greece and Turkey, um, because the Soviet Union was pressuring um, Turkey and Greece to become communist nations. And so we're going to talk about how that plays out. Um, now, what is going to be the, the uh, policy for the United States under Truman? And uh, historians have gone back and looked at Truman's policy, and it was very wise, is he is going to um, advocate for containment. Now, he didn't come up with that. A, um, an American ambassador to the Soviet Union named George F. Keenan, Keenan, the containment, he's going to advocate that the United States should just try to contain the spread of communism and so forth. Uh, and so what, uh, what he's advocating for is, it's kind of like I use this analogy. Let's say you spill a cup of water on a table, okay? You, when you when you go to clean it up, you don't grab a table and put it or grab a, a towel and put it right in the middle of the table and cause more water to spill off the table. What you do is you try to stop it from spreading first. Okay, you stop it from going off, running off the table, and then you eventually clean it up um, at, and so forth. But what the policy of containment is, you don't confront communism head on. Okay, you just contain its spread. Okay, try to prevent it from going into new areas such as China or South Korea or South Vietnam. Um, and eventually communism will or collapse from within. Now, Keenan's prediction came true because it does collapse uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union starting in 1989 to 1991. Okay. He was long dead um, since then, but his, his prediction came accurate. 
And so that's why we don't have World War III is that we don't typically confront them head on. Uh, Eisenhower is a little more aggressive. Kennedy wanted to be a little more aggressive. Um, um, Johnson, not as not quite as much, except for Vietnam. And then um, Nixon is going to be a little more um, uh, not confronting communism head on. And now that will Carter Reagan is going to kind of try to confront communism a little more head on uh, in the 1980s. So you've got to know what containment is and so forth. We're going to talk about each of these things, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, and uh, NATO. So this is an important slide that you may want to either print off or, or take uh, definitely take notes on. Um, that's what um, Truman's policy is going to be, is containment. And it really kind of continues, for the most part, throughout the uh, Cold War for other presidents. And so one of the things that um, um, Truman is going to have passed or, or Congress is going to pass is what's called the National Security Act. It does create the Department of Defense, okay, which we still have that department in our government today. It's a very plays a very important role. Um, also, the president is going to establish the National Security Council. The president still has that today, where it gives uh, advice on the president on security matters, and and they um, because the president can't physically do everything. You've got to have great people that work under you to be effective, and um, it, it expands. And that's their role is to look at national security worldwide. Uh, of course, the CIA, this was Army Intelligence during the war, and now it is the CIA. And the Soviet Union had originally created the NKVD, um, but after uh, World War II, they uh, changed it to the KGB. And you're going to see lots of spying going on between the CIA and the, and the uh, uh, KGB. And uh, also the Voice of America is going to be created um, to radio broadcast uh, about the evils of communism in Eastern Europe. And then, of course, you're going to have Radio Moscow um, blasting into Western Europe how bad capitalism is. Um, also, Congress um, brought back the military draft. And so there's going to be uh, an American draft basically from 1940 uh, through the early 1970s when eventually the draft uh, ends uh, in, at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, and so forth. So if you're an 18, once you turn 18 as a male citizen of the United States, uh, you're required to register for the selective service. Uh, I had to do it when I turned 18. Doesn't mean you're going to be drafted. It just means if the draft ever comes back, you could potentially be drafted uh, and so forth. So let's look at the Truman Doctrine, the first attempt at containment uh, in uh, American history. And uh, what ends up happening is Stalin, um, who they control the northern part of the Black Sea with Ukraine and, and Russia here. So uh, you got Ukraine right here and, then, and Russia up here today. They wanted to control completely this, this um, strait right here through uh, uh, present day Turkey. And so Greece and Turkey allowed you to do that. So um, the communist parties were trying to kill the, the democratic leaders and so forth there and get other problems. And so what Truman says is that look with uh, this called the Truman Doctrine that we're gonna pledge financial support to any nation that's actively resisting communism. And so how you remember the Truman Doctrine is what you have for Thanksgiving, Greasy Turkey, okay, Greece and Turkey. Um, and so the United States gives $400 million to help Greece and Turkey remain um, democratic. And guess what? They are democratic to this day. And so the Truman Do Doctrine is a thumbs up success. It prevents the Soviet Union from complete control um, of the Black Sea and the Dardanelle Strait. And so it, the Truman Doctrine is a success. So way to go, Harry S. Truman. Now, George Marshall um, would, was a five-star general during World War II and had retired uh, from that role and uh, actually was asked by Truman to be a Secretary of State. Now, George C. Marshall um, in the 20th century is one of our, our best and most famous Secretaries of State. Um, you, you, you have to uh, really know the Marshall Plan. It's going to be on a quiz Typically, uh, it will be on your test, um, so it's very important to know the Marshall Plan, um, and it was a, a overwhelming success. I've never heard an historian say the Marshall Plan was not a success. It doesn't matter uh, your, the historian's views. The Marshall Plan is successful. What it was is Western Europe is in shambles from World War II, and uh, Marshall's like, hey, communism doesn't happen in good economic times. It always happens in bad economic times. We need to... to give money to Western European countries to rebuild. They can hire workers, get them out of this terrible depression that they're in after World War II, and they can rebuild their country. And then that will keep communism from spreading there. It works brilliantly. Um, the U.S. gives $13 billion to various Western European countries. It leaves a legacy of European friendship that lasts all the way today. 
Uh, and it's a double thumbs up success. And Stalin is very frustrated um, because he offers uh, what is called the Molotov plan um, to try to give communist dollars to those Western European countries. And they reject it. Um, none of those countries in Western Europe become communist. Um, and it works brilliantly. And so um, applaud George C. Marshall, the Marshall Plan and Congress voting to pass it because today it is seen as very successful. So you can see how much money was given. Um, and as a result of this money, it works brilliantly economically. 33.5% increase in the gross national product for those countries. It's, it's without question it was successful. Okay. And so I love this political cartoon. Stalin can't block the uh, Marshall Plan, even though he offers a Molotov plan and, and it was rejected. So ha, take that, Stalin. Now, the Berlin blockade was um, another uh, conflict that um, emerged in the Cold War, and Truman handles it brilliantly as well. There's another reason why Truman is praised um, since his death in, world, uh, in, in, in American history. So Stalin is frustrated uh, because Berlin um, is in the middle of East Germany. There was four divided zones of, of Germany, the British, the French, and the American uh, sectors of West Germany end up uniting to create a country of West Germany, and West Germany actually joins NATO, which I'll cover later. Berlin, though, was divided up into a British, French, American, and Soviet zone, and it's also West Berlin combines, and then East Berlin is part of Germany. A lot of the Germans wanted to get the heck out of communist East Germany because uh, Soviet Union forces it to be communist. In fact, East Germany is going to be very poor throughout all of the Cold War, while West Germany is going to be very wealthy uh, because of capitalism and democracy. Um, and so a lot of Germans were escaping West Germany through West Berlin. They would get to West Berlin and they would either catch a flight or a train to West Germany. Stalin was livid about this. He wanted the um, allies um, in Western Europe to give up West Berlin. So what he did is he blockaded it where it prevented people from coming in and out. And he was going to starve out the Berliners to basically abandon the Western Europeans in the United States and become part of East Germany. So Stalin, or, uh, sorry, Truman has three options. He can either A, give in to Stalin and let him have Berlin, which probably would send a message that the Soviet Union could do other more aggressive measures and expand communism to other countries. Or option B, he could uh, confront Soviet Union head on and have World War III and led to uh, you know, thousands and millions of loss of life. Or he could do option C and outsmart him. Uh, as you can imagine, he goes with option C, and he doesn't confront him head on, but he's not going to give in either. So what he does is for about a year, it was about 11 months, um, the United States around the clock um, takes has planes take off from West Germany and they drop in supplies every day to West Berlin. And so he doesn't starve them out. Uh, he doesn't allow them to starve out. And Stalin is kind of tied with his uh, hands behind his back and he can't do anything. He also doesn't want a World War III and he's forced to uh, abandon the blockade of Berlin. So Truman brilliantly outsmarts um, Stalin. And, and it's one of my favorite moments of the 20th century, because anytime Stalin looks like an idiot, um, it's a good day uh, for the United States during the Cold War. And so um, Stalin backs down and the Berlin airlift worked uh, brilliantly. Milk, a new weapon of democracy. So dropping off milk and so forth. Okay. So the Berlin airlift is a Cold War success for the United States. Now, what was not a Cold War success is the um, same year is two things happened. One, China falls to communism, which I'll cover a little bit later. And then also um, the um, uh, Soviet Union successfully tests their first atomic bomb. Now, we knew the Soviet Union was going to acquire atomic weapon, but we thought it would probably take until 1951, maybe 1952-ish to develop it. Um, they develop it much sooner than that um, because Julius and Ethel Rosenberg um, – gave away nuclear secrets to the Soviets. Now, it, critics at the time argued that they were uh, falsely accused and so forth, but uh, one of the things that happens in the mid-1990s when the uh, KGB released their, uh, well, the former KGB released their uh, Soviet-era uh, records, it is uncovered that there were paid uh, spies uh, on the Soviet payrolls, and uh, the Rosenbergs were one of them. Another one was Alger Hiss. So, um, and we'll cover Alger Hiss later with the uh, second Red Scare, but they are tried uh, with uh, espionage, are convicted in 1953, and they're both actually electrocuted. 
Now, uh, what ends up happening, once the Soviets test their first atomic bomb, um, it leads to a panic. Americans are like, holy cow, if the Soviet Union have an atomic bomb, they can bomb us. And that's where you start seeing um, these Cold War era, um, um, these Cold War era bomb drills and so forth, where people were getting out of their desk and they called them duck and cover drills and so forth. And so um, what, what ends up happening with this uh, uh, kind of, testing of the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb, it leads to what's called MAD, not to be confused with the comedy show, but mutual future destruction. If you, if the Soviet Union attacked us, we're going to attack them back and we're both going to destroy each other. Okay. And vice versa, if we attack them, they would destroy us. So um, thankfully cooler heads prevail, even in the uh, uh, Cuban missile crisis that, that neither one pulls the trigger. Um, the U S tests our first hydrogen bomb, which is far bigger than the original atomic bomb in 1952. And the Soviets did the same thing in 1953. It's a one-up competition with this arms race. Okay. Arms race is referring to the buildup of military weapons. Now, one of the things that's going to lead to uh, post-war prosperity economically is a massive spending bill. It was a deficit spending bill. Um, and also it, it increased, uh, taxes in the country. It's called NSC-68. All it stands for national security. Council-68, uh, it proposed a tax increase and um, a massive uh, uh, government spending on the military. And so you had tons of defense contractors, such as Lockheed Martin, L3, and many others, Raytheon, Washington uh, Demilitarization, and others that are going to benefit from these massive government projects. And it led to tons of jobs in the United States and great economic prosperity. The problem is, though, in order for that to continue, you're going to have to continue that kind of military spending. Um, and when the United States stops doing that in the early 1990s, we're going to have a recession as a result of that. Um, the reason why it's passed by Congress is seen as anti-communist. OK, now um, I originally was going to cover uh, China falling to communism in the Korean War uh, in this lecture, but I've gone a little bit long. And so I'm going to, uh, to cover this in part two of this.